I wanted to give another perspective on LP duality. So what you saw so far was this, I would call this a um, constructive form of duality because we actually construct uh, basically a new inequality from our current set of primal constraints. And we manipulate it so that we, we, look, we find something that looks like the primal criterion value on one side, and on the other side is just whatever came out of this inequality you constructed. And by setting the leading uh, term here to C, we've actually constructed a lower bound on our, on our primal linear program. That's one form of duality. Um, now, if you think about what we've done here, you might think, wow, that's really not going to work for uh, pr problems outside of the class of linear pro programs. So for example, what happens if I change C transpose x to be um, x transpose qx, okay, where q is positive semi-definite? What's going to fail here? What are you going to, you're going to end up with this, and then you're going to try to say, okay, this gives me a lower bound on x transpose qx, but that's not possible, right, to construct such a lower bound with this strategy because this is a linear function of x. I can't get from this a bound on x transpose qx. Okay, so that was like the second most simple problem we learned, quadratic problems, programs. And now you can imagine if my criterion is just some, you know, fairly complicated convex function, this constructive form of duality is not going to work for me. I'm going to kind of get a roadblock when I, when I get here. I mean, these constraints could themselves even be nonlinear, right? They could be convex constraints. But it, it might be very hard to construct a lower bound on the criterion value from a bunch of constraints when both of those are not linear anymore. Okay, that's why this second form of duality is actually really, really useful. It's just that um, I like to think about duality for LPs in this way because it's so transparent. So let's, let's kind of rehash a, uh, another perspective on LP duality. So we're going to kind of go through a completely different way that ends up being equivalent. You can see we actually get the same dual problem as we did several slides ago. Um, and here's the, here's the explanation. For any u and v big and equal to zero, so same setting, I actually introduce a variable that corresponds to my equality constraint and a variable that corresponds to my inequality constraint. Or actually, remember, u has one component for every equality constraint and v has one component for every inequality constraint. And again, I constrain vi to be big and equal to zero for all of its entries. Um, and I, I observe that if, uh, if x is primal feasible, just the same observation as before, I'm starting off the same spot, then I can take the criterion value, c transpose x, and I can say, actually, that's bigger than or equal to c transpose x plus u transpose ax minus b. Why? Because this is going to be 0 if, at, at a feasible point x, right? So of course, this is not contributing anything. And uh, this is going to be in every component um, non-positive, right? I'm going to have g, gi transpose x is going to be less than or equal to hi. So this is going to be less than or equal to 0 for every feasible point. And vi is bigger than or equal to 0 in every entry. So of course, this whole inner product must be less than or equal to 0. So all I've done is I've added something to the primal criterion value that's less than or equal to 0, this whole bit, u transpose ax minus b plus v transpose gx minus h. And I've called this whole um, right-hand side, a function of three variables, which we're going to call the Lagrangian, L, X, U, V. Okay? So this, this function of three variables, L, X, U, V, it always lower bounds C transpose X, as long as V has um, all its components bigger than or equal to zero, and X was primal feasible. So because I have this inequality, right, C transpose X is bigger than or equal to L x u v for all feasible x. And I remember I had v is bigger than or equal to 0. I can actually now take the minimum here on both sides over feasible points x. So let's just call c the feasible set. So this is the set of points x that satisfy the uh, primal LP. If I minimize this over all such points x, what do I get? I get exactly f star by definition. It's the minimum of c transpose x over all x that satisfy the constraints. 
And of course, because this inequality holds for every feasible point x, it's going to have to hold after I take a minimum. And uh, this is what I get. Okay, now here's really the, I'd say, the magic of this second dual construction. Now the insight is that if we drop the constraint that x is feasible, we still get a lower bound. So if I actually now think about taking this minimum over all x rather than just over feasible points x, then clearly I've only made this right-hand side smaller because the minimum's over a larger set. Okay, and this is called the Lagrangian. What I'm writing down now is going to be only a function of u and v because I've minimized out over x. This is what I call the Lagrange dual function. Now it turns out this construction is actually the, it gives you the exact same thing as the other construction we saw. It's just a different way of, of looking at things. So let's, let's uh, go through this explicitly. What happens if I try to minimize over all x uh, this Lagrangian, LXUV? So the first thing that's helpful to do here is to group terms that multiply by x. So I'm going to get c plus a transpose u plus uh, g transpose v transpose x. And then what's left over is minus b transpose u minus h transpose v. And now I'll take a look at that. What happens if I minimize that over x? If I minimize this function over x. Well, it's a linear function. If it happened that, for example, this leading uh, vector here wasn't 0, then the minimum of this is minus infinity. Right? If any component of this leading vector, c plus a transpose u plus g transpose v is non-zero, then I can make this, this criterion as small as I want just by taking x um, Right, to be in the opposite direction of whatever that component was. No constraints on x. And so I get minus infinity. So this ends up being minus infinity if c plus a transpose u plus d transpose v is not equal to 0. And otherwise, what do we get? If this is 0, then of course all we get is uh, minus b transpose u minus h transpose v. So here we, here we have it. We've actually constructed the minimum of the Lagrangian. Here it is. And the dual problem is to maximize this lower bound over all u and v to get the tightest lower bound possible. And actually, you can see here we actually have just constructed g u v. It's this function right here. So if I maximize this over all u and v with v being bigger than or equal to 0, I get exactly this problem. Right? Because I'm told that I get a minus infinity if this is not equal to 0. And so this becomes a constraint of my dual problem. C must be equal to minus a transpose u minus g transpose v. Right? So this is like having the indicator of a constraint, basically. And if the constraint holds, this is what the criterion is, minus b transpose u minus h transpose v. OK, let me pause for questions about that construction. It's different, but it's equivalent, and it's going to be the one that we carry forward beyond LPs. No? OK. Um, just to reiterate, the reason we like this is because it's actually completely general, and it's going to apply to arbitrary optimization problems. That's what we'll cover next time. I claim, although I claim it kind of with a, an asterisk or something, you know, there's this kind of like a, a catch here. Um, but we'll cover that next time. This even applies to non-convex problems. So you can even talk about duals for non-convex problems. Uh, 
For non-convex problems, we're going to see something called weak duality always holds. So you'll get a lower bound. But um, yeah, it just, you have, I mean, there's kind of a game that we, we'll see next time. There's a bit of a game that we can play for unconstrained problems to introduce constraints. Good question. Okay, um, I can't tell whether people find this really easy or whether they're confused. So if, if I've misgaged and you guys are confused, make sure to speak up. I think the way that duality goes, at least from my perspective, is it all seems really easy, but then you get something remarkable out of it. And so it's all a bunch of very simple arithmetic, but then, you know, very simple algebra, but then something really remarkable comes out as a result. So it's kind of subtle. Um, Let's go through this example. I really like this example. Um, I feel like the max flow min cut example, everyone sees. So that's why I went through it kind of quickly. You always see that example. This, this kind of minimax matrix game strategy, uh, you tend not to see as much. Um, so I made, I made this example. Let's suppose we have this, this game, and we're going to pit off two players, uh, player J and player R. I'm curious, who knows what that, who player J is? Who knows who that is? You know who that is? Yeah, it, that's John von Neumann. So um, why is that relevant? Well, he actually he invented this, this, uh, this a theorem called the Minimax, uh, John, von, John von Neumann's Minimax theorem, and actually kind of started LP duality. So um, you can maybe attribute all of LP duality and potentially all of duality to von Neumann. And it started off with something like this, um, with this example. So uh, let's suppose we have two players, J and R. And we have this payout matrix P. And here's how the game proceeds. Um, if player J chooses I, he, have, he has uh, M options, 1 through M. If he happens to choose option I, and, uh, and player R chooses J, he has his N options, 1 through N. Then we go to the particular entry in this matrix, PIJ, and we say that uh, J must pay R PIJ. That's the way the game is played. And you don't have to feel too bad for, for von Neumann. This can be uh, positive or negative. So if it happens to be negative, that means that R is actually paying J. Okay, so it, it, the matrix has both positive and negative entries. Okay, so that's the, that's the setup. And these two players are going to try to you know, pit their strategies against each other and, and play this game as optimally as possible. Um, we're going to look at what's called mixed strategies. So that means that we're not going to have the players choose deterministic strategy, a deterministic choice, but they're going to actually put forth a probability distribution over their options. And uh, in particular, we're going to think about um, the probability that J chooses I among his options uh, 1 through M is going to be XI. So X is going to describe the uh, probabilistic playing strategy for player J. And player R is going to have his own probabilistic playing strategy Y. So the probability that he chooses option J is going to be just YJ among options 1 through N. OK? So that's, that's the setup. And we're going to think about how would, uh, ac how would players J and R, R go about choosing these strategies X and Y to play this game kind of as optimally as possible. Um, what's the expected payout matrix from J to R according to these strategies? Right? It's, it's, uh, it's fairly simple to think of. If we think about, for example, these strategies as being independent, the probability is that, that you know, our, the event that J chooses I and R chooses J to be independent, because we don't really know what the other person is doing, then um, the expected payout from J to R is, is simply uh, you know, this very simple sum of, of Xi times y, Yj times Pij over all I and J. An expectation, that's how much money J is going to have to pay to R. And this can be, again, just to reiterate, positive or negative. Right? Because the entries of P can be positive or negative, this can be positive or negative. So I can actually succinctly represent that in matrix form as X transpose PY. Okay? That's the expectation of the payout going from J to R if, if, if we play with these strategies X and Y. Now let's, let's think about two scenarios. Um, let's suppose that because player J is like much wiser and you know, he invented this game, uh, and he invented duality, he's going to allow R to know his strategy ahead of time. He's going to say, you know what, I feel sorry for you, I'm going to give you X. You can know my strategy, choose your Y however you want. So he's not going to tell me what decision he makes, but he's going to tell me his probabilistic, um, 
his, his strategy according to the probabilities. So what would R do in that case? He would choose Y to maximize the payout coming to him. Right? He would choose Y to maximize X transpose PY over all Y that are valid probability distributions. That would be the best idea for R at this point. Okay, so uh, this ends up being actually right, um, just hedging your bet on the biggest entry of P transpose X. Okay, so if I want to maximize for fixed X, right, X is fixed. If I want to maximize um, Y transpose P transpose X, which is the same thing as this criterion, X transpose PY, over all Y that are non-negative and, and add up to 1, right, this constraint must uh, be put there because otherwise that wouldn't be a probability distribution, then I just get out of this. You're going to put YI basically in the biggest entry of P transpose X and 0 elsewhere. So it's going to reduce to the strategy where you always pick uh, the same option i, and that corresponds to the largest entry of P transpose x. Okay, so because J was very wise, he knows that if he were to give x his strategy ahead of time, that he actually can see that, well, R would probably do this, right? Because this is R's best strategy. So given that J is, is going to be admitting his, uh, his probability vector x to R, he's going to ahead of time pick x to minimize the payout that R is going to expect. So he's going to minimize the maximum payout going from J to R, because that's going to be his best strategy, right? So that, that is actually an LP. Minimize over all X the maximum of I going from 1 through N of P transpose X in the ith component, subject to X being a probability vector. X big and equal to 0 and 1 transpose X is equal to 1. We're going to see why this is an LP just in a second, but you might kind of see it already. Okay, so just to pause. This is the optimal strategy for J, right here. If he were to give his probability vector x to R ahead of time and presume that R would do what's optimal for him, which was choose Y to give this payout. And of course, because J doesn't want to pay very much, he's going to minimize this payout over all x. So that was, we kind of thought, thought through what each player would do with that particular situation. Now let's flip the, flip the script and suppose that in some crazy alternate universe, R was the wiser one. And he said, uh, you know what, Jay, I'm going to let you know my strategy Y ahead of time. And you can do whatever you want with it. And we thought the same thing through. We would actually end up at this problem. This is how, how in that situation, R should choose his strategy Y. He knows that um, once he gives his strategy Y to player J, player J is going to choose uh, his strategy X according to the biggest entry of PY. Okay, the, the, oh, sorry, the smallest entry of PY, because J is the one who's paying. And R wants to maximize his payout, because he's the one who's receiving the money. So he's going to maximize overall Y, the minimum overall J of PY in the Jth component subjects to Y being a probability vector. So it's just the kind of exact complementary situation. So let's call um, J's expected payout in the first scenario F1. So F1 is going to be the optimal value of this, this particular convex problem, uh, F1 star. And let's call F2 star the optimal value of this problem. So it, it's the payout um, in the second scenario. Okay, clearly because it's advantageous to know the other player strategy. Right, it's clearly advantageous to know the other player's strategy. I don't know why I said J here. I'm sure I, this should have said R, obviously. So R's payouts are going to be either F1 star or F2 star. This is scenario 1 and scenario 2. So because it's helpful to know the other person's strategy, from first principles, you would say that F1 star must be bigger than or equal to F2 star. 
That's the way these two things are ordered. Because in the first situation, R was actually told J's strategy ahead of time. He acted optimally, and this is how much he's going to receive at the end of the day. And the second strategy, R actually gave his probability vector to J ahead of time, and so forth, and this is how much he received. So clearly, it's, since it's better to know the other person's strategy, F1 star is bigger than equal to F2 star. So that's what we conclude. This is the uh, amazing part of von Neumann's Minimax theorem. Von Neumann's Minimax theorem actually proves that for any payout matrix whatsoever, these two are actually equal. So it doesn't matter who knows whose strategy if both players act optimally. Okay, it's a very interesting kind of game theoretic conclusion, and it led to a lot of research in game theory, as well as optimization. It's called the von Neumann Minimax theorem. We're going to prove this. It's actually not very hard to prove. Um, well, we're going to prove that these two are LPs, and actually we're just going to assert that duality holds, strong duality holds, and then next time we'll, we'll see why that's the case. So let's, uh, are there any questions before I work through that? OK, let's just work through that. Um, let's recast that first problem as an LP. So this problem right here. Uh, I, oops, I, don't, I guess I don't have it on this paper, but here it is in the slide. Minimize over all x maximum of p transpose x in the ith component subject to the probability simplex constraint on x. Let's cast this as an LP. How are we going to do that? We're going to introduce kind of an auxiliary variable t. And we're going to put a constraint that t must be bigger than or equal to all the entries of p transpose x. We're going to replace the criterion by t and put those extra constraints in. So that's all we've done here. Right? t is uh, just a scalar. Place the criterion by t. And we've put in the constraint that p transpose x in every component has to be smaller than or equal to t. So this is clearly the same as the first problem. right? Because at the solution, we're going to get inequality here. And so it's going to be the same the same problem. And now you can see this is really an LP, right? Everything's linear, the constraints and the criterion. And we can derive the dual now in, in either the first way or the second way that we learned, the constructive way or the way that's called Lagrangian uh, duality. And I just put up here as an example the construction via Lagrangian duality, but you could do it the other way if, you're, if you wanted to. We construct the Lagrange dual function, which takes the criterion and it uh, Let's write down the various multipliers. So we have x bigger than or equal to 0. We have um, 1 transpose x is equal to 1. And we have p transpose x is less than or equal to t. This is really t times the 1 vector. OK, that's our problem. And I'm going to rewrite this as x less than or equal to 0. So that's helpful that way. And Sorry, minus x less than or equal to 0, of course. And I'm going to introduce um, a dual multiplier u here. I called this one um, v. And I called this one y. And y must be bigger than or equal to 0 in each component, and so must u, because of the uh, inequality constraints here. No constraints on v. So the Lagrangian then, right, is a function of uh, x, and then all of my dual variables, u, v, and y. Uh, and also t. So it's a function of my primal variables as well as my, my dual variables, x, t, and u, v, y. And I get it by taking the criterion and subtracting off the relevant linear combinations of constraints. So here I have u transpose minus x, so I get minus u transpose x. Um, and here I have, uh, say, v transpose 1 minus 1 transpose x. And here I have, um, let's say, y transpose p transpose x minus t. So I form the Lagrangian. Um, if I group this, let me group this into everything that multiplies x and everything that multiplies t. You're going to see that all the things that multiply 
um, x, let's say, first, I'm going to get minus u um, minus v transpose Did I miss something here? Oh, right, v times the ones vector. And here I have uh, plus p times y transpose x. And as for t, I have um, 1. And the only other occurrence of t is, is here is just minus y transpose 1 times t. Sorry, this should be, say, plus. And the only thing that's left over after all of this is just v. Everything else I've absorbed. So that's the Lagrangian. And this, for the same arguments as before, if I were to minimize this over, um, if I were to minimize this over all x and t, then it would be either minus infinity if these leading terms weren't zero. Otherwise, it just would be v. So that's the Lagrange dual function, right? And when we form the Lagrange dual problem, uh, it's exactly the linear program that maximizes v subject to these constraints. Now, v acts as a slacked variable in that problem. Let's write that down. Maximize over all v and actually y and u, all my uh, dual variables. I'm going to maximize v subject to the following constraints. Um, y transpose 1 is equal to 1. Um, py is equal to u plus v times 1. And then the non-negativity constraints on u and y. That's my, my dual problem. After I eliminate slack variables, So you'll notice here that actually u serves as a slack variable, right? u is bigger than or equal to 0. I can just change that to be py is bigger than or equal to v times the 1's vector. And v itself actually acts as an auxiliary variable. Remember, it's really for the same reason as, as the way t did. We get uh, exactly the, uh, the other LP problem that you're interested in studying, right? which is this guy. Um, Maximize over all v subject to y bigger than or equal to 0. 1 transpose y is equal to 1. py is bigger than or equal to v. And once we, like I said, eliminate the rule of b, v, we get this problem. The flip LP in the scenario where who knew whose strategy was flipped. So in other words, what we've just shown through this calculation is that this problem and this problem are duals of each other. This is, if we call this the primal LP, we just constructed the dual LP, it ended up being this problem. So just by duality, we know that the optimal value of this problem is bigger than or equal to the optimal value of this problem. And based on what I told you, the only way those two things aren't equal is if both the primal and the dual were infeasible. But actually, in this case, that's not true, right? They're both feasible. And so by uh, LP duality, the optimal values are equal. So F1 star is equal to F2 star. I think it's really a remarkable conclusion um, it's very surprising in this particular context. Any questions about that? Okay, so if you haven't seen it before, you might find it interesting just to read a bit of history on duality. Um, it started with, in some sense, it started with this theorem and started with LPs and then it kind of blossom into very general, very beautiful theory and optimization. So next time we're going to talk about uh, duality in general convex problems, not just linear problems. That'll be on Tuesday. And we're going to see very precise conditions under which the, the dual and the primal match in terms of their optimal values. And we're going to see that actually leads to the conclusion that for LPs, they pretty much always match, like we claimed in this lecture. They only don't match when both problems are infeasible. And the calculations that, like this, which, you know, may seem, if they seem new and surprising, they'll become kind of very routine after you do them a few times. Constructing duels becomes a very uh, 
a very kind of natural thing to do after you've done it a few times. And you'll get lots of practice with that. So, okay, I will see you guys on Tuesday.